People have been using sticks since ancient times to knock seven shades of shit out of each other. Examples can be found all over the world. But it's Ireland that is still famously known today for its deadly shillelagh. Today the word is often used interchangeably as a term for a blackthorn stick. But shillelaghs could also be made from oak, ash or hazel. However, it is the blackthorn we'll be discussing today since it is the most ubiquitous and existentially frightening of the hardwoods which were commonly used. Blackthorn is a species shrouded in superstition under Irish lore. It's often found growing on mounds known as fairy rings and so has a mystical and often terrifying association with fairies and the other world. The 1930s Schools Collection Archive gives us a surprising number of tales about priests using shillelaghs for a number of different reasons including one priest in Roscommon who used his black torn stick to put down the local faction fights before they began and another priest in Offaly who used his to win a fight against the devil. But we'll come back to its mystical associations in a wee bit. As a weapon, shillelaghs have appeared at various times and places throughout Irish myth and history. Sticks which bear a striking resemblance to the weapon we recognise today have been found in excavations of sites around Europe, although I was unable to find evidence of any being found here. However, the authors of ancient tales such as the destruction of Dodderga's hostel included clubs made from thorn wood and bound with bands of iron as the weapons used by the ancient men and gods featured in the stories. Gerard of Wales in the 12th century described the carrying of walking sticks which were used as weapons. A carved stone tomb in Kilkenny's 13th century St. Canis's Cathedral depicts various saints holding weapons and books which were presumably Bibles. Among them, St. James appears to be holding a knob stick. Later, the 18th century in Ireland saw waves of rebellion by farmers who refused to pay unreasonably high tithes to absentee landlords, during which the shillelagh would have been a widely and readily available weapon for the working class rebels who needed them. Bailiffs sent by evicting landlords would frequently have felt the sharp end of the tenant shillelaghs as, in desperation, they attempted to fight back and prevent the loss of their homes, their farms and their livelihoods. Then, as the 19th century dawned, English fears of a repeat of the French Revolution in Ireland resulted in an increasingly brutal put-down of Catholic Irish society by their English and Anglo-Irish overlords. This normalisation of extreme physical force used against the Irish people contributed largely towards the popularisation of the shillelagh as a staple item to be carried by every able man and occasionally woman whenever they would leave the house. It should be noted that this photo from 1916 is of women training in stick fighting with the Irish Citizen Army in preparation for the Easter Rising, which would ultimately lead to the liberation of 26 Irish counties. But before Ireland's most successful strike for freedom in the early 20th century, the brutal reign of England here 800 years beforehand provided a vicious breeding ground for violence, not just between the the working and upper classes, or between Catholics and Protestants, but infighting was common amongst communities of impoverished Irish Catholics, the working classes who had localised grievances to settle. Faction fights became common between opposing local groups in areas all over Ireland. They often happened at public events such as the local fair, at a sports match, or at a wedding or a funeral. Reasons for these faction fights were sometimes described by outsiders as being trivial and it is tempting to write off the reasons for such violence as the fighting nature of the Irish but quite frankly you know where you can shove that stereotype. Throughout their history shillelaghs have been used against both Ireland's oppressors and also against our own fellow country people. The shillelagh could be anyone of a number of sizes. It might have its 
horns left on or taken off, and the art of using one efficiently is called Batarakt, after the word bata meaning stick. The term Batarakt has been experiencing a revival since the 1990s, urged on by reconstructionists who wish to recreate and learn what they say is one of Ireland's oldest martial arts. I haven't yet managed to pin down any of these practitioners for a demonstration, but I have watched a few videos on YouTube. So here you go. Ready, Dave? <coughs> Some people say it would have been used one-handed and held about a third of the way down with a knobbly bit protecting their elbow. This could then be used to deal quick blows like this. Other people say it may have been used two-handed though, with a sort of a boxing motion. You could also deal devastating blows by utilizing the thorns down the face or across the chest. And you have to remember, it wasn't just the physical terror these things could inflict. It took a certain kind of person to cut a blackthorn. Like, it was thought to be very unlucky to cut blackthorn in many parts of Ireland. In Louth, a tale tells of a farmer whose two horses died because he removed the blackthorn trees from a mound after deciding he would no longer bother avoiding it when he was ploughing his field. In Ballinard, in County Limerick, a maker of blackthorn sticks made the mistake of cutting a particularly fine one from a local lis or rat. A sickness fell upon him which is said to have caused growths resembling the buds of spring to sprout all over his body. A visitor to the house noticed that the blackthorn stick in question had the same buds growing from it. The blackthorn was brought back to the mound it came from and left there, an acknowledgement of wrongdoing for the spirits who dwelled within. The man was restored to health thereafter and presumably learned his bloody lesson. These fairy forts were considered to be extremely dangerous places and were taken very seriously indeed by the people who lived among them. Best practice was to just avoid the place altogether, but that wasn't always possible. In the case of one unsuspecting passerby in Limerick, who tried his best to walk wide around the mound, but had to walk by it nevertheless, he saw a flash of light and fell in a faint on the road. And when he came to, he was inside the lists, watching a hurling match being played therein by the ghosts of his dead friends. It was said of the mound by local residents that one of its blackthorn trees had sprung from the blackthorn stick of a soldier buried there many years before. And whether it was the fairies or the dead you'd encounter, the idea was to just avoid that situation altogether. Like, totally. Take note, those of you with fairy doors, AKA fairy portals. So the man who cut a black thorn to make himself a weapon was a brazen man indeed. Even if he didn't walk up to the most ominous looking fairy mound in the whole village and cut a black thorn with a heartfelt pledge to do the devil's work. His intended victims didn't know that. And in some areas, it didn't matter where it was cut from. It was still considered to be bad luck. The practice of shillelagh fighting began to decline rapidly towards the 20th century with the Catholic Church encouraging the playing of slightly less bloody sports such as hurling. Jesus, it must have been bad if they thought hurling was safer. Fastest field sport in the world. If you'd like to know more, I have a video about it, which I will link at the end. So the next time you hear the Dubliners singing about Shillelagh Law or Bing Crosby's twee little tunes about shamrocks and shillelaghs, picture people getting their actual skulls literally opened by the mystical and deadly staffs which have been plucked from the grip of the fairy folk who owned them. No, they didn't teach you that in school, did they? Ask your granddad about that stick gathering cobwebs in the corner. What was he using it for? Hmm. But then there's so much about the species growing in our very own backyards that has been lost to us. Some of our most common species, like blackthorn, were of the utmost magical importance to Irish society. In daily life, they provided medicine and food for people and animals alike. Some were particularly sought after at times of spiritual significance, such as the pagan festivals of Imbolg, Baltana, Lunasa, and Samhain. Thankfully, traces and records of some of these practices 
have survived throughout the centuries and have been collated by me for your convenience. Herb Magic in Ireland, an introduction, is a three hour online course I've put together, which can be purchased through the Irish Pagan School, link in the description below. The class begins with the earliest mentions of herbal healing and herb magic in the ancient mythical sagas of Ireland, leading nicely into the importance of herbs and their healing and magical properties to the people who lived under Ireland's Brehan laws. We cover the introduction of highly organised love gurch and pleasure gardens with the coming of the monasteries which was a really influential period for the use and cultivation of herbs in an increasingly religious society. And of course the later witchcraft trials under English rule which have secrets to reveal about the medicine women who were using their native wildflowers to heal and cure their communities. And despite centuries of English oppression the pagan rituals of the Irish people have survived right through to the modern day. Hear about our most prized magical species, which could do anything from warding off fairies and witches to fortune telling to love potions. For those who are interested in herbs as medicine, the course is also chock full of mind boggling medieval practices, as well as the regional uses of Ireland's favourite medicinal wildflowers to prevent and cure illness. With enough practical theory to get you started if herbal medicine is something you'd like to explore further. I've also included a bibliography and list of invaluable resources for those interested in all aspects of herbs and herb magic. And you can avail of all of this for the very reasonable price of 40 euro to be enjoyed at your leisure as many times as you please. Just visit the Irish Pagan School via the link in the description below and don't forget to keep an eye out for future courses by myself, Tara Tyne, your humble resident ditch witch. So if you're still watching, don't forget to hit that like button. It's a free way you can support this channel because it will increase the amount of revenue I get from the ads on this video from the price of one coffee to the price of two coffees. Mama really likes our chai lattes, okay? And do feel free to hit the subscribe button if you'd like to see more of my videos. I upload most Thursdays and you're not gonna wanna miss it. Slán agus bánacht, goodbye and good luck to you. Okay. Today the word is often used in